Well, good evening. Good to see you with us this evening. Good to have you with us this evening. Seems like gospel meetings, and, and it really seems regardless of the length of time, it seems like they just start and end. It just seems like they, they go by so fast. And so that certainly seems to be the case with uh, the meeting this week. Let me say, first of all, that I appreciate the invitation. I'm not sure who threw my name in the ring, but I certainly appreciate whoever did. And I appreciate the, the faith and the trust that they had in me to be able to come and to hopefully uh, speak God's word and speak things that would be an encouragement and, and be helpful and uplifting, and most of all, scriptural and in glory to our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I appreciate all of those who have had me in your home or have taken me out to eat. Uh, it has been very hard to get hungry around here, and so I certainly appreciate your desire to want to do that, whether that be to cook a meal or whether that be to uh, take me out and, and feed me at a restaurant. And for those maybe that had desired to do that and it just didn't work out for you, I appreciate you wanting to do that. And so that, that means a lot. Uh, of course, Michael and Brenda has been great to stay with them. Uh, though they are Yankees fans, it has proven the fact that Yankees fans can be hospitable, can be kind, can be gracious, uh, can provide every need that you would need and some that you didn't even realize and anticipate everything. But I'm still not a Yankees fan. So I apologize for that. But it has been great to be with them and to spend some time with them. And, and, and uh, that's, a, uh, that's a work in and of itself when you want to have someone to come in your home that you have not met and that you don't know. And so that, that's kind of a leap of faith. And so I appreciate them being willing to do that and being willing to be hospitable. I appreciate the congregation here and I appreciate the kind words that, that you have said. It, it's always difficult for me when, when someone says, well, that was a good lesson because I... And, and several of you, uh, uh, I've made the comment, said, well, to, to God be the glory on that one. Because uh, it, it is to God's glory that whatever ability or, or talent or um, the ability to, to reason and to study from God's word, that it, is, it has come from our Heavenly Father. And so I, I'm just striving to be the channel through which his word gets to you, his people, so that you might be able to serve him, him better. And so I appreciate the kind comments, but I'm, I'm more appreciative of the fact that you are appreciating the message of God and the scriptures. And so I certainly uh, appreciate that and appreciate all of, of the kind words. It has been good to be with you this week, and so I hope that you can say it has been good to be here as well. I want us to direct our attention to three chapters in Genesis, and we won't be covering all three of them. Basically, it is the end of chapter 4, chapter 5, and the beginning of chapter 6. And I've simply entitled this lesson, When Two Became One. And so as you think about this text, one of the first things that I suppose as you think about the text and maybe even more so as you think about the title is, okay, well, what two became one in, in this text? And when you look at the text, it seems rather obvious that the text has described two families. We have a lineage that descended from Cain, and then we have a lineage that descended from Seth. And so in that text, we have the family of Cain and generations that followed after Cain. And then we have generations of Seth and those that followed after him. And so as you look at that, that certainly seems to be what is, is, is played out here. And we see the Cain having a son, and then a son, and then a son, and then the generations thereafter. But when you look at that, there are some things that I think stand out in, in reference to these two families, and that stand out in reference to uh, the way in which these two families are described. For instance, when we go to Genesis chapter 4, and verses 17 
through 22, we may not catch the fact that the genealogy of Cain seems to be rather brief. It's the, the brevity of that genealogy may not hit us until we go to Genesis chapter 5 and we see the genealogy of Seth and we're like, wait a minute, there's a lot more said about the genealogy of Seth than was said about, about Cain. And so that's the first thing that's kind of an interesting thing to observe, the brevity of Cain's genealogy. In fact, it takes one verse to cover seven generations in Cain's family in chapter 4 and verse 18. And then that seventh generation of his family, we find that there is additional information given about that. And and that's interesting to me. When you consider the fact of biblical numerology, and you think about the fact that there are some numbers that just always have a certain meaning to them and a certain connotation to them. And you think about the number seven, generally we think about the number seven as the number of completeness. And it's interesting that as we think about the genealogy of Cain, here we have something said specifically about the seventh generation in Cain's family. We go to Seth's side and we find that Seth's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 is very different. From the standpoint, there is a lot of additional information that's given to us about Seth's genealogy. In fact, we have three verses for one man, as opposed to one verse for seven generations of Cain, and 12 verses for all of it. And again, what stands out is the fact that as we are... are Minds are called to the seventh generation of Cain and something is said about him and some additional information is given. Guess what happens in the seventh generation of Seth? We have that same thing over there. The seventh generation of Seth's line is, or from Seth's line is genealogy, is Enoch. And we have some additional details given about Enoch. Now we're going to look at those two in just a minute. But I want us to think a little bit about Cain's side and what is said about Cain's side. Genesis chapter 4 said that Cain, verse 17, had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Names mean something, and generally speaking, as you read in the Old Testament, there will be an event, there will be something that happens, and so we're going to call this place this, because this is what happened here, and that's what that means. And so here we have Cain having a son and calling him Enoch. Now the term Enoch, and you see Enoch is, is the seventh generation in Seth. The term Enoch and the name Enoch just basically meant dedication or train training in something. And so the question then is, okay, so Cain names his son Enoch, and that carries with it the idea of dedication. But dedication to what? Training in regards to what? What was it that Cain Cain seemed to have in mind? Well, he builds a city. And he builds this city, and he calls it Enoch. He calls it dedication or train. I want to suggest to you, and then it's going to be proven, I think, as we continue, that it seems as though Cain's mentality is, and Cain's line, as we certainly see in the seventh generation with Lamech and then with Lamech's sons, it seems like Cain's line is going to dedicate themselves to life on earth, to the physical things of life. I'm going to build a city and I'm going to dedicate it to my son. And then when we get to the seventh generation, we find things that are being invented by the sons of Lamech that make life easier. Their sole focus seems to be on improving themselves and improving their existence. And so I would suggest to you, at least at the outset, that Cain's line had a very earthly, almost prideful, kind of mentality. We're going to build a city 
and we're going to dedicate ourselves to making life better. I think this is proven in here in just a little bit as we look at Lamech's uh, sons. But for the moment, we'll move on to Seth's line. And what's interesting in regards to Seth is that when Seth has a son, it is stated that Seth calls him Enosh. And the meaning of Enosh is man or mortal to be weak or sick or frail. Well, that kind of seems like a bad name, doesn't it? Cain names his son Enoch, training and dedication. And Seth names his son Enosh, mortal, to be weak or frail. But notice that in chapter 4 and verse 26, that when Seth names his son Enosh, the last phrase of that text is, then men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. What was in the mind of Seth when he named his son? Men are frail, men are weak, men are mortal. Men need to call upon the name of the Lord. They need the Lord. Cain named his son Dedication. And we see in just a minute what they dedicated themselves to. And it had nothing to do with serving God. But Seth has a son and he names him Enosh, recognizing that man is mortal and man is weak and man is frail. And the response was, we need to call upon the name of the Lord. And so the perspective of Seth was a very spiritual, humble perspective. It wasn't the prideful, earthly perspective that you see in Cain's line. And this becomes, in my mind at least, rather clear because when you get to the seventh generation of humanity and you look on the line of, of Cain, you see that this mentality has come to its completion, to its fruition, to its ultimate. It is the ultimate expression of pride and dedication to earthly things. Lamech, his prideful attitude is expressed, and we see his attitude in that he takes two wives. Almost as if Lamech was to say, I'm too much man for one woman. And so he takes two wives. And you say, well, I think you might be extrapolating a little too much from that, Adonis. Well, I want you to notice the speech that he gives to his wives. And I want you to notice the pride and the arrogance and the boastfulness of this man. Ada and Zillah, chapter 4 and verse 23. Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech will be avenged seventy-sevenfold. If Cain was worthy of a sevenfold vengeance, now let me tell you, I'm so important, I am worthy of seventy-sevenfold vengeance. That was the value I want to suggest to you that Lamech placed upon himself. I am so proud, I am so boastful. Lamech was so full of himself that he said, if anybody tries to kill me, they're going to be getting 77-fold vengeance. I'm way more important than my forefather Cain. I want to suggest to you that that's the ultimate expression of pride. And that's why I say that as you look at Cain's line, I say, well, he just named his son Enoch, and that just means dedication. Okay, well, look at generationally where that led to in the seventh generation. By the seventh generation in Cain's line, you have a man that is so full of himself and that is so prideful, he said, I'm worthy of 77-fold vengeance. But then you look on the other side, and you look on Seth's line. And it's interesting, almost as if the text is is trying to make a juxtaposition for us in that, okay, well, here is Lamech with two eyes, but on Seth's line, twice we are told that he walked with God. 
So here's Lamech standing over here with his two women, and here is the testimony of God in regards to Enoch. He walked with God. He walked with God. And God took Enoch. This is a story that we know. We teach to our children. It's just, you know, a a verse there. But we teach to our children that, that Enoch walked with God and God took him. And that's interesting. Because I want to suggest to you that as Lamech was valuing himself over there on Cain's side, God looked at Enoch and that was the value that God put on Enoch. God took him because of his righteousness. He walked with God, and so God took him. That was the value that God placed on Enoch. And I want to suggest to you that that, for that side, that was the ultimate expression of godliness. Look how far Seth's descendants have come. That God looks upon them and sees that they are so righteous and so so valuable, at least in the the form of Enoch, and he takes Enoch from the earth to give him his reward, as if you would say, early. To give him his, his inheritance early. We have two very different families here. When you look in Genesis chapter 4, you see the things that Lamech's sons do. And it may not seem that, you know, impressive. And you're like, well, okay, well, that, that's kind of interesting. But think about it. If you're, if you're operating from the standpoint of we're going to dedicate ourselves to this earth and we're going to dedicate ourselves to physical things, then it's not surprising that you would see that, that Lamech sons dedicate themselves to making life on earth good. And they learn how to make a good living. They become professional herdsmen. They learn how to... Forge bronze and iron. They learn how to, if we're going to work, and if the earth is cursed, if we're going to work, then we're going to learn how to make work easier. And so they learn how to forge metal. And then we're going to learn how to be entertained and enjoy ourselves and have entertainment. And so they create musical instruments. You say, well, what's wrong with any of those things? Well, well, nothing. Nothing's wrong with any of those things. But remember, if my focus is just about on the earth, then I'm going to make sure that I'm making sure that my work is made easy. I'm going to make sure that my entertainment is pleasurable. I'm going to make sure that I learn how to to be the best professional herdsman, if you will. I'm going to learn how, how to have my career be good. But all the focus is just here. It's just a physical perspective. But on the contrary, you look at Seth's side, and it's very different. And they were told of Seth's generations that it was then when he named his son Enosh that men began to call upon God and that men began to walk with God. Cain's descendants was focused upon the here and now and Seth's descendants was focused upon God, walking with and calling upon the name of God. And so you have one family with a very physical perspective and another with a very spiritual perspective. And so you end up with two families with two perspectives going in exactly the opposite direction. I want to stop just for a minute and make an application. I want you to think about the fact, how do you think Cain's descendants were thought of from a from just an earthly perspective, how do you think they were thought of? They had made life easier by learning how to forge metals. They had been able to invent musical instruments so that it would be for pleasure and for entertainment and for relaxation. And so that would have been a wonderful thing. And I'm not knocking musical instruments and I'm not knocking the ability to forge metals. But but how do you think that they were thought of? I would say that there were probably people who praised them for their ingenuity. Wow, I'm so glad that you figured out how to do that. Esteemed them for their innovations and held them as great men who helped make life easier. You know, we stand with the benefits of men today who have made our lives easier. 
men like Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb or the phonograph record, or Henry Ford, inventing the automobile and the assembly line production, or Alexander Graham Bell, invented the phone. Or maybe you're not as familiar with the name Percy Spencer, but you are sure familiar with the microwave because we, we've all got the microwave. And so we think about, boy, these men were great. Look at what these men were able to do. Yes, and you know, none of them were spiritually minded men. And so I wonder that people look at the time, of the, the men of Cain, and the descendants of Cain, and say, boy, they really made life great. Yes, they, they did, but they weren't spiritually minded. And what they did while making life great did nothing in preparation for eternity. And so that makes me think, what do you hope to accomplish, or maybe you've already accomplished Is it financial security or academic achievement or maybe you're a successful entrepreneur or athletic accomplishment or some sort? What is it that you're striving to accomplish? Or what is it that you're most proud of? Do you look more like a descendant of Cain? Or do you look more like a descendant of Seth? You may enjoy a physically successful life, as did Cain's family. But such will not compensate for spiritual failure. I want you to consider in Matthew chapter 16 a familiar passage. And then we'll go to one that maybe isn't quite as familiar. In Matthew chapter 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. It may be that you've been very physically, financially, enjoyed a great deal of earthly success. That's fine. But have you learned to walk with the Lord? Or has your focus and your dedication been just to this earth? Or have you understood what Seth understood, that men are mortal and that men are frail, and they need to call upon God, and they need to look to God and serve Him and think for eternity? In Psalm chapter 49... We're not going to read all of this psalm. In Psalm chapter 49, there's some interesting statements made. Beginning in verse 5, Why should I fear in days of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surrounds me, even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches? No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. For he sees that even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought, and I like this, their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. Don't you kind of imagine that was in the back of Cain's mind? I'm going to build a city, and it will last forever. They have called their lands after their own names. Cain built a city and did what? Called it after his son. I want everybody to know that this city is after my son. I'm going to name it after my son. But man in his pomp will not endure... He is like the beast that perish. In verse 16, the psalmist says, Do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. Though while he lives, he congratulates himself. And though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers, and they will never see the light. 
Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. That was a summation of the attitude and the disposition of the line of, of Cain. And so as we go back to Genesis, we see that we've got two families going in very different directions, with very different perspectives, very different outlook on life. And yet we turn the page to chapter 6. Now it came about. We've got some time that has passed. And so we wonder, well, are these two families still going in two different directions? Are these two families still uh, one with a completely different perspective than the other? Are they still diametrically opposed to each other? Well, let's see. Now, it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made men on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. What happened? We had two families going in completely different directions with different outlooks and different perspectives. And then came time and men multiplying. And suddenly we don't have the text saying that we've got this family over here and we've got this family over here. Now we've got the text saying, and mankind. What happened? What happened is the two families started intermarrying. Who are the sons of God and the daughters of men? Well, I want to suggest to you, if we've been following the text from chapter 4 and chapter 5, the text has been demonstrating to us that we've got two families. We've got, we've got a side that, that's acting like men and serving carnal interests, and then we've got another side that are acting like God and, and servants of God. But now the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth have intermarried. And the text has demonstrated that we've had two very different perspectives. But now the sons of God, the spiritual-minded descendants of Seth, and the daughters of men, the earthly-minded descendants of Cain, have intermarried. And what happens then is they go from spiritual if you will, to sensual. And so a mingling of the two lines began when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they began to intermarry. And as a result of that, we no longer have two perspectives. We have one perspective. And it is not the perspective of Seth and what Seth's family had been. It's now the perspective of Cain. And there's violence and there's wickedness and there's evil and there's immorality. And that's Cain's side. And this created a conflict with God. And God said, my spirit's not going to strive with man forever. Because there was no longer a difference between the families. It was irrelevant now if you were a descendant of Seth or a descendant of Cain. Because they were all acting like the descendants of Cain. They were all wicked. I think there's a lesson, maybe more than one, I'm sure, but one of the lessons that I would suggest to you is that when a spiritual person decides upon a course of action from a sensual perspective or standard, he ceases being spiritual at that moment and starts down a pathway of sin. And it may just be one decision. 
And it may not be that he's gone completely over into sensualism or completely over into carnality, but when he makes that first choice, and you know what? It might just be a look. Because that's how it started in our text. When the sons of men saw, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, It started with the look, looking at the wrong things, gazing at the wrong things, thinking about the wrong things. In Romans chapter 8, we're just reminded of the fact that these things don't mix spirituality and sensuality. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Well, we've already seen that, haven't we, in Genesis 4 and 5. We've got Cain's line thinking one way, and we've got Seth's line thinking a very different way. We've got one dedicating himself to making life better here, and we've got another calling upon the name of God and recognizing that man is mortal and frail and weak and needs God. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The same thing is mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. This this war between the works of the flesh and the spirit, and the, the flesh and the spirit, it's a war within us as to which will be our perspective. Will we follow after the works of the flesh, or will we follow after the fruit of the Spirit? And so Paul acknowledges that there is this war going on within us. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for those who are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. John identifies things of the world in 1 John chapter 2, in verses 15 and 17. When John says, of the things of the world, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Again, think back to the line of Cain and the line of Seth. The love of the world was in the line of Cain, and we're going to make life good here. While the love of God was in the line of Seth, going completely different ways in completely different directions. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. It is from the world. The world is passing away. Also, it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. You know, there have been plenty of examples in God's Word of individuals choosing and making choices from the basis of a sensual, carnal, physical perspective. Eve looked at the tree And it was a delight to the eyes. Had the tree changed any? Had the tree suddenly become more beautiful? No. Eve had listened to the devil and listened to the lies of the devil. Had the daughters of men gotten more beautiful as the generations went on? No. But the sons of God began to walk away from their spiritual perspective and began to notice things from a physical perspective. And that was their downfall. Achan, when I saw among the spoil, I saw something and I desired it. Samson told his parents, give me this woman. Why aren't you getting someone from Israel? Well, she looks good to me. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, the woman is very, was very beautiful in appearance. How many times do we find ourselves making choices? Well, I think that's good. Well, that looks good. Well, I think that'll be okay. But do we consider the eternal spiritual consequences of those things? I want you to consider something in this. Who was in the position of leadership? It says the sons of God. They were in the position of leadership. The spiritual minded were. And yet, who influenced who? The sons of God were corrupted. It is certainly true that good can influence the wicked. And so I want to just 
read a couple of passages that indicate that, that yes, that it can happen. The same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of the wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. It is possible for good individuals to have an impact and good behavior and good actions and good demeanors to have an impact upon those who are wicked. But evil far more often corrupts the good. And we are told that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, evil company corrupts good morals. And it's interesting in that text that as we think about what is the evil in that context? In that context, the evil were brethren teaching a false doctrine. And if that's the case, in reference to just brethren teaching a false doctrine, how much more is that the case when we broaden that to men who are not brethren, and men who are not Christians, and men who are immoral and ungodly, and yet I think, I think I'll be okay if I hang around them. And Paul is warning about brethren teaching false doctrine and he classifies them as evil and it's going to corrupt you. How much more will I be corrupted if I choose to hang around evil, immoral, and godly people and say, ah, it's not going to bother me. It's not going to impact me. It's not going to affect me. I wonder if the sons of God said that when they married the daughters of men. Let me suggest to you three things that we've learned this evening and the lesson will be yours. You may attempt and you may even accomplish great things physically at work. You may be able to build things, raise money. You may be able to to, uh, be a great charitable uh, benefactor to individuals. You may raise money. You may do wonderful, great, fantastic deeds here on the earth. But walking with God is the only pathway to eternal blessings. Don't forget what's truly important in this life. We walk by faith and not by sight, brethren. Decisions that we make with our senses, well, I think that that's okay. Well, that just feels right. Well, it looks like it's going to be okay. We'll be at the expense of what is spiritual every time because we've already established the fact that these two things are going in opposite direction. I can't say, well, I'm going to make that decision based upon senses and carnality and expect a spiritual Benefit, outcome, or reward. When the godly fellowship with evil, the godly are more often corrupted than the evil are purified. And so what's your perspective on life? Is it physical and sensual or is it spiritual? How do you make choices? How do you make decisions? Who do you go to? Who do you listen? Who are your sources? Who are your confidants? Who are the people that you trust? Who are the people that when they give you an opinion, that's who you listen to? Are they carnal, earthly, sensual, or do you listen to the spiritually minded, godly individuals? What is your perspective? We either look like we belong as the descendant of Cain, or we look like we belong as the descendant of Seth. And I hope that we recognize that while we live on the face of this earth, that we are just strangers and pilgrims and whatever we build stays here, whatever we acquire stays here, as the psalmist recognizes, and whatever we tell ourselves, as the psalmist indicates, I hope that we're telling ourselves, but this is just temporary. It is not what is important. And I hope that we're building things and laying up treasure in heaven. If you're here this evening and your life is not what it needs to be and we can help you make it right, Let us know what we might do. Come forward. Well, together we stand and while we stand.